Workshop de colaboração online, nosso WCO. É pura expansão. É um grande experimento social nesse momento tão único que estamos vivendo. Eu estou muito emocionada que vocês estão colaborando junto com a gente. Olá a todos, é, bem-vindos ao WCO. Esse workshop de colaboração online foi feito para você que tem interesse em contribuir com o fortalecimento da rede, conhecer pessoas, fazer networking, estimular a sua social. Então você não pode ficar fora dessa. Venha fazer parte desse time com a gente. O workshop de colaboração online é um sonho coletivo de pesquisadores e professores e estudantes e simpatizantes da área de sistemas colaborativos que queria se encontrar no modo online em tempos de pandemia para discutir projetos, desafios, é, grupos de pesquisa, apresentar seus trabalhos e formar rede de colaborações. Então, o WCO é um lugar para conexão e formação de novas redes de colaboração. Incrível essa galera, gente! Planejar o WCO com essa, com essa turma tão bacana me faz acreditar que o evento vai ser muito mais que incrível, muito mais que bacana. Muito aprendizado, muita colaboração. Eu estou muito animada e feliz. Vamos que vamos! Mais do que nunca, a palavra colaboração tomou conta dos nossos meios de comunicação. Nesses tempos de pandemia, principalmente, como que as pessoas colaboram? como que a tecnologia pode influenciar cada vez mais, que as pessoas, de tal forma que as pessoas possam se ajudar as umas às outras. É isso, e é para isso que o WCO surgiu, para que a gente consiga colocar nossas ideias em termos de tecnologia da informação e de computação em prol da colaboração entre as pessoas. O workshop de colaboração online 2020 vem chegando com muitas novidades. Nesse momento de tantas mudanças, né? vem experimentar e fazer parte de uma rede de construção coletiva e colaborativa com muita criatividade, alegria e aprendizado. E por que você precisa participar desse evento? Bem, compartilhar conhecimento para discutir os desafios da colaboração, para se divertir e mostrar de forma alegre e descontraída suas descobertas, sua pesquisa. Venha para o WCO. Até lá. Aqui não tem tempo ruim. Bem-vindo a todos ao WCO 2020, bem-vinda Letícia, bem-vinda Adriana, esse sonho se tornou realidade, hein? Estamos aqui na abertura do WCO 2020, um sonho sonhado há três meses atrás e que agora, pelo amor em ação, pela força do coletivo, se torna realidade. Letícia e Adriana, como é que vocês estão se sentindo nesse momento? Como é que está o tempo interno aí? <risos> Boa tarde, adrenalina pura, né, gente? Mas muito feliz de, de estar dividindo a tela aqui com vocês e com vocês aí do YouTube, do Facebook, pessoal. Boa tarde a todos e, como eu já falei, aqui não tem tempo ruim, né? É todo mundo animado para o WCO e surpresas e interações ao longo de três dias. E eu também estou me sentindo muito animada, muito feliz, estou me sentindo realizada de estar com vocês e de ver né, isso aqui acontecendo, as pessoas já estão chegando, né? É, vamos aqui compartilhar, a gente tem uns pequenos slides com algumas informações sobre o evento, né? É, então, primeiro, a gente queria agradecer muito os apoiadores desse evento, esse evento não se faz sozinho, é a primeira edição, é, e como eu falei, é um sonho coletivo, né, e que a SES, que apoiou muito a gente nesse sonho, a Comissão Especial de Sistemas Colaborativos, né, e a gente contou também com o apoio da ACM SIGCAI e de 11 universidades parceiras que vibraram com a gente e que acreditaram nesse sonho e que vieram com a gente compor esse time, então, muito, muito, muito obrigada a todo mundo que acreditou nesse projeto e que está aqui agora com a gente. É, Vaninha, foi um evento que foi organizado de maneira orgânica, onde cada um conseguiu 
contribuir né, e oferecer o que tinha e o que sabia. Isso foi muito legal. Sim. É... E aí, a gente quer começar, né? Já que é um evento de colaboração, a gente não gosta de ficar sozinho no streaming, né? Como se a gente não tivesse um grupo. Estamos aqui com mais de 50 pessoas, né? É, participando no Facebook e participando também no, no YouTube. Então, a gente quer saber de vocês, gente, como é que vocês estão por aí. Né? Então, tem aqui uma pesquisa, tem aqui o mente.com. Entra lá no mente e digita esse código que está aí, ó, 29546665. E conta para a gente como é que vocês estão se sentindo. E no final, a gente vai saber como é que está o, o tempo interno, né? Como diz a Adriana, que não tem tempo ruim, a gente quer saber como é que está vocês aí é, nessa, nesse momento, né? Como é que vocês estão se sentindo. Quer falar um pouquinho, Letícia, do teu parâmetro lá? Tempo cachorrinho? <risos> É, numa escala doguinho aí, como vocês estão se sentindo hoje? Ótimos, ok, man, as coisas estão difíceis, mas a gente continua lutando, Eu estou num lugar né, dark, dark place. <risos> Acho que a gente vai, vai ter muito doguinho animado aí. Eu só quero ver se eu, eu tô com a minha tela do mente... Uh, aberta aí, e eu só quero ver se eu vou dar um... se eu for, for reduzir ela, se vai continuar aparecendo para vocês aí. Acho que sim. Se você quiser mostrar a sua tela, compartilha aqui, que eu mostro para o pessoal a tua te tela aí do mente. Dá tá, um stream aí. Enquanto isso, eu vou ler rapidinho aqui alguns comentários. Tem muita gente amiga aqui, né, no chat. A Raquel. A Raquel falou um comentário aqui que eu achei super bacana, eu queria ler. É, muito bom, está vendo consolidado aqui o trabalho que surgiu para unir a comunidade nesse momento de isolamento e sem poder fazer os eventos presenciais, muito bom a Patrícia disse que gostou muito da proposta a Cristina Bichar está aí, uau, parabéns meninas a Carla, então tem várias pessoas aqui do SBSC, gente, que bom que bom ter vocês aqui com a gente Vamos seguir, então vou respondendo aí no mente, tá? A gente vai... Eu tô com a minha tela. Tela. Veja aí, Vaninha, se tá aparecendo ou não. Aí, olha aí. A galera tá muito bem, ó. Estou <risos> ótimo. Estou ótimo, estou ótimo. Vamos ver aí até o final do nosso, da nossa apresentação e o início do nosso evento em definitivo. <risos> Então tá, né? Então falando um pouquinho aqui do nosso evento Continuem dizendo aí do seu tempo interno, quem chegou depois é, Trazer um pouquinho da motivação, né? A mensagem da Raquel já trouxe um pouco uma síntese Qual foi a motivação para o WCO, né? O WCO foi um evento sonhado há três meses atrás Quando a gente decidiu que o SBSC não iria acontecer esse ano O SBSC 2021 vai ser em abril e a gente percebeu que esse era um ano muito é, simbólico para a comunidade de sistemas colaborativos, né? A pandemia, ela trouxe uma transição para o trabalho remoto feita a toque de caixa. Era uma tendência que existia, mas que de repente se acelerou muito na época do, do, desses tempos né, de pandemia. E sistemas colaborativos têm um papel fundamental nessa transição, em todas as áreas, né? E... 30 ou mais anos de pesquisa da área, de repente a gente viu muito espaço ainda para novos avanços, para coisas novas acontecerem. Então a gente pensou nesse workshop e a gente pensou ele como um espaço diferente. A gente vai mostrar um pouquinho ao longo dessa apresentação e vocês vão poder curtir também ao longo do evento que a gente não, não desejaria ser um workshop convencional de apresentação de conteúdos. A gente acha que os workshops estão fazendo um ótimo trabalho nas conferências, os congressos de usar as ferramentas para transmissão de conteúdo, mas a gente queria mais a essência da colaboração, onde fosse um ponto de encontro, onde pesquisadores pudessem vir para discutir problemas, discutir soluções, apresentar seus grupos de pesquisa, seus projetos de pesquisa e discutir os desafios da área. A gente trouxe esse grande motivador também de pensar quais são os próximos 10 anos de sistemas colaborativos. Já que a gente acelerou tanto com a pandemia, o que, é que nos aguarda nos próximos 10 anos, né? E, além disso, a gente gostaria muito de fortalecer a comunidade de sistemas colaborativos no Brasil e também na América Latina, né? E ser um esquenta para o SBSC 2021. Então, a proposta 
é que quem participar do WCO já tenha o SBSC 2021 como um objetivo, e vocês vão ver durante as sessões que a gente vai estar sempre incentivando de que, de que isso seja feito. Tem algo mais a acrescentar? E meninas, podem me interromper também, é uma apresentação colaborativa, tá? Então, o objetivo é esse, né, reunir a comunidade de pesquisadores, não só da pesquisa, isso é bem claro também, o objetivo do WCO é integrar também a extensão, é integrar também a indústria, é integrar, integrar organizações não governamentais que trabalhem com grupos, que precisam das tecnologias para colaborar no modo online, fomentar essa troca de experiência e criar redes, é muito o objetivo da gente de criar novas redes de colaboração e desenhos de pesquisa a partir dessa colaboração e da integração de vários atores, né? E esse foco na colaboração multidisciplinar, com foco no, realizado no, no mundo virtual, né? Então, o WCO, ele nasceu online, ele pretende continuar assim, né? Nos próximos anos, ele é um workshop feito para esse movimento mesmo do virtual. E apesar de ser o primeiro ano, né, a gente teve uma resposta bacana da comunidade. Então foram 24 posters submetidos, a gente teve duas principais formas de participação. Uma era a partir dos desafios em sistemas colaborativos, chegaram oito desafios para a gente. E a partir dos posters, nós recebemos 24 posters, 10 relatos de experiência em projetos, oito relatos de experiências multidisciplinares e seis grupos de pesquisa e extensão. E aí, nessa nuvem de palavras, dá para ver que COVID-19 é uma palavra forte nas nossas submissões, né? Então, realmente, esse momento da pandemia está motivando as pesquisas na, no na nossa área, né? Além de outros termos, como tecnologias, contexto, planejamento, a própria palavra né, colaborativa, colaboração, aparece muitas vezes, né? Então, um pouco disso que vocês podem esperar em termos de é, trabalhos né, enviados. Letícia, fala como é que está os inscritos. Vamos lá, então, com quantas mãos se faz a colaboração, hein, gente? Aqui a gente viu que são com muitas mãos, né, a gente tem representantes de todos, todas as regiões brasileiras aí inscritos, as inscrições, né, elas vão seguir, porque a gente tem, então, uh, dia de hoje, terça-feira, quarta, né, aqui um pouquinho, então, dos, do, dos números, né, de, 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 desculpa, de estados que estão representados aí, Rio de Janeiro, Minas Gerais, Bahia, São Paulo, Pará, são os top five aí, não, Rio Grande do Sul também, tá, então, se faz com muitas mãos, e também com muitas ferramentas e plataformas colaborativas, né, gente? O nosso trabalho aqui também foi... A gente usou intensamente e o nosso workshop também está com muita diversidade de plataformas aí para a gente se desacomodar bastante e aprender e conseguir interagir e colaborar. Então, até o total hoje, né? Acho que era até perto do meio-dia, por aí a gente estava analisando, estava acompanhando ali, só foram um, dois, três inscritos, 123 inscritos. Uh, vocês querem comentar alguma coisa aí, meninas? Então, aqui então são os inscritos, podemos passar para o outro. A nossa organização também, como a Vaninha mostrou lá no início, né? 11 universidades se envolveram aí, se integraram, e foi um chamado que a gente fez, né, uh, através de uma. De um, de um questionário que a gente divulgou aí para a área de sistemas colaborativos, enfim, aberto, e o pessoal foi chegando e a gente foi se organizando, se auto-organizando aí. Uh, a gente tem, então, o pessoal do Sudeste, na Universidade né, Federal do Rio de Janeiro, Universidade Rural do, uh, do Rio de Janeiro, a Universidade Federal de, 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 dos Vales do Jequitinhonha e Mucuri, Minas Gerais, a uh, Universidade Federal de Itajubá, né, a Universidade Estadual de Santa Cruz, no Nordeste, Universidade de Fortaleza, Universidade Federal uh, de Pernambuco. No Sul, aí, a gente tem o, a, a PUC, né, a gente tem a Universidade Federal do Pará também. Então, e os nossos amigos voluntários também divididos aí, tá, tá pequenininho aqui para mim, mas de várias universidades, Instituto Federal de Tecnologia do Norte de Minas Gerais, a UFRJ também, o FBA, né, o Federal da, da Bahia. A Unifei também? A Unifei, é, é, é a... Ah, tá <risos> Aí você falou inteiro, eu fiquei com a sigla. Federal de Itajubá, é. <risos> Itajubá. 
Vamos lá, então. Aqui é o nosso time, né? Foi um time dos sonhos mesmo, porque foi todo mundo dando o que tinha e o que sabia, o que podia naquele, nos diferentes momentos que a gente teve de envolvimento, estamos tendo ainda, né? Adriana, eu, Vaninha, Angélica, Carol, Jorge, Juliana, Luciano, a Melise, o Paulo, a Noemi, o Rafael e o Rodrigo. Ah, eu, queria, eu queria dar um grande abraço, se eu sei que esse time está todo aqui nos comentários, gente, sintam-se abraçados, o StreamYard tem um limite de pessoas, então a gente trouxe só as coordenadoras gerais e de programa do evento aqui, mas de fato vocês estão aqui com a gente em todos os momentos, né? Eu queria dar um, um grande abraço assim, ao Rodrigo, que é um profissional de design que voluntariamente apoiou a gente com todas essas telas bonitas e cards e site e tudo mais, então um grande beijo aí para o Rodrigo, né? E uma coisa muito legal que eu achei dessa forma de organização do WCO é que não tinha diferença professor e aluno. Então, esse time de alunos aí é o nosso time de organização. Eles estavam com a gente tomando decisões, é, apoiando e coordenando junto. E foi uma experiência muito especial, né? De ver o crescimento desses alunos e a integração deles com a gente, né? E outra coisa muito legal também foi é, que cada a gente não teve papéis muito específicos né, durante o evento, só no final que os papéis foram naturalmente se estabelecendo com base em interesses. Então, eu achei uma experiência muito interessante, que no início eu pensei que poderia até não dar muito certo, porque muita gente sem um papel rígido poderia, enfim, sobrecarregar. E a experiência que eu tive é que isso não aconteceu, não houve sobrecarga, cada um deu o que, tá, o que podia, no momento que podia, com base no seu desejo, no seu interesse, e até ontem a gente estava numa sinergia, como a Angélica colocou aqui, né? sinergia total, é, foi esse sentimento também, né? de muita sinergia, e eu acho que tem a ver um pouco com essa ideia, né? de cada um contribuir é, com seu interesse, com a sua paixão, enfim. Né? Então, gente, muito obrigada a cada um de vocês. Seguimos. Aí, o grupo de voluntários amigos, eu vou falar rapidinho o nome aqui da Maria Clara, o Ailton, da Federal da Bahia, a Bárbara, o Jonas, o Flávio, a Beatriz, a Luciana, o Felipe, a Marcela e a Tereza. Muito obrigado também. Meninos, vocês estão sendo de muito valor aqui neste momento. Então, aí, como vocês podem ver, tem um pedacinho, né, uh, na verdade, um resumo da nossa, da nossa programação, que também está lá no site, né, hoje, aqui, segunda-feira, então, a gente está fazendo a nossa sessão de abertura, logo em seguida, a gente já vai chamar o Mark, né, o nosso convidado, nosso, nosso keynote internacional aí, para nos falar, nos contar, estou super curiosa aí, para conhecer essa técnica de design fiction, né, que a Adriana está nos, nos apresentando aí também, e depois vamos ter o social break, vamos ter uma celebração, tá cheia, tá recheada de coisa gostosa aí pra gente fazer, pra gente se distrair, pra gente se movimentar também, né, levantar aqui um pouquinho uh, da cadeira, todo mundo aí da plateia podendo interagir junto, e tamos, estamos com várias ferramentas também, tanto pra, pra gente poder interagir de maneira síncrona, né, como de maneira assíncrona, então, a gente tem aí o Padre, que é a nossa galeria, depois vocês podem acessar na página lá, tem todos os links para vocês uh, já conseguirem visitar os trabalhos que foram publicados, que foram aceitos, uma, uma galeria para a gente se conhecer e colocar momentos interessantes. Né? Amanhã, então, a gente tem a primeira... Uh, desculpa, hoje ainda a gente tem a nossa primeira sessão né, de discussão dos pôsteres. Uh, amanhã a gente conclui ela, né, o pessoal vai concluir ela com os participantes, quem quiser também uh, participar aí é muito bem-vindo, e a gente vai iniciar na terça-feira a sessão dos grandes desafios de sistemas de colaboração com os desafios que foram uh, enviados. Uhum. Depois a gente tem a, a reunião, né, Vaninha, se você quiser falar aí um pouquinho... Tá, é, sim, a gente tem a Assembleia da Sesc, a gente vai destrinchar um pouquinho isso aí nos próximos slides, eu queria só destacar aqui, né, que um dos objetivos também desse WCO foi estudar as, as possibilidades de, de, de comunicação e de interação, então a gente investiu um bom tempo do grupo em pesquisar as ferramentas, e a gente chegou nessas que, no nosso ponto de vista, para o formato do evento, eram as, as que se adequavam melhor. Então, na interação assíncrona, tem, temos o Padlet, 
e a gente convida mesmo vocês a, a visitarem lá os murais que foram criados, e o Discord também, que eu não sei se é uma ferramenta que vocês estão acostumados. E aí, quem for participar do evento, já baixa o Discord, já coloca aí no seu celular, no seu computador, porque vai facilitar muito. E a gente tem o auditório do WCL, que vai ser no Zoom, é, para momentos onde a gente tenha que integrar todo mundo, e o Discord para as interações em subgrupos, né? E, e o YouTube e o Facebook, as sessões de amplo alcance, que é a palestra convidada e o painel, a gente optou por usar o StreamYard aqui, que ele faz uma transmissão simultânea para YouTube e Facebook. Então, a gente está com essa transmissão rodando nessas duas plataformas agora. E tem uma central de dúvidas, é, alguém, algumas pessoas estão colocando algumas dúvidas aqui, a gente já pode responder algumas, mas qualquer dúvida que vocês tiverem, vocês podem mandar para esse e-mail, coordenação.wco.gmail.com, ou o e-mail, ou Hangouts, a gente está com um plantão lá de voluntários, para tirar qualquer outra dúvida, né? O Zoom e o Discord, é importante baixar, é, fazer download das, das ferramentas, e para receber o link, você vai ter um link de acesso. E esse link de acesso é para as pessoas que estão inscritas. Então, se você está inscrito no WCO, você já deve ter recebido esse link. Se você não recebeu, manda um e-mail para o coordenação.wco.gmail.com E se você é, não, ainda não está tá assistindo esse stream, mas ainda não está inscrito no WCO, para conseguir esses links, você precisa se inscrever. É gratuito, é só entrar no site, se inscreve, e a gente manda os links para vocês, tá bom? Então, aproveita, se você não se inscreveu ainda, vai lá que dá tempo. Isso aí. Então, para fechar ali, como a Maninha estava falando, na te... só para fechar a quarta aí, a sessão final dos desafios, e o grande painel Latam, então, com os nossos convidados também. Quem, vamos comentar aqui a, a dinâmica, então, de... Posso comentar? É, Pode ir. Só, é, o Paulo está até aqui, ele já deu até alguns comentários, né, Paulo? O Paulo estava aqui orientando a galera de como vai ser a sessão de, dos pôsteres, que vai começar logo daqui a pouquinho, às 16 horas, né? E a sessão dos pôsteres e a sessão dos desafios também, a gente tem três formas, assim, a dinâmica, ela consiste de três momentos com três ferramentas diferentes. Então, no pré-evento e o formato A5, são os murais nos Padlets. Então, já está lá disponível. É, talvez a gente possa colocar aqui o link, é, Adriana e Letícia, se vocês conseguirem puxar o link, a gente posta para a galera já ir clicando lá no, no mural. O Discord e o Zoom, o link precisa estar tá inscrito novamente, né? E aí o Discord já tem vários, tem o canal WCO e já tem vários subcanais. Então, cada um dos posts submetidos pertence a um grupo, cada grupo é uma cor vermelho, verde, azul, e aí você, às 16 horas, vocês vão para o Discord, é, 15h30, vamos para o auditório pegar a sessão social, e 16 horas vocês vão para o Discord, para as discussões em subgrupos, tá? E aí depois, é, no segundo dia, que vai ser amanhã às 14 horas, vamos todo mundo para o Zoom para fazer uma integração. Então a dinâmica basicamente é essa, a gente tem um momento offline com as discussões prévias, depois um momento de discussão em subgrupos, e depois um momento de integração com todos os grupos conversando. Essa é a dinâmica dos pôsteres e a mesma dinâmica para os desafios. E aqui eu só queria ressaltar, né, os organizadores, a Melise e o Paulo estão na liderança dessa dinâmica. Obrigada, Melise e Paulo. E a Carol e a Juliana estão como chess da sessão de, dos desafios. Valeu, Carol, valeu, Ju. E é a mesma dinâmica, só muda aqui as datas. A gente tem os desafios no Padlet, tem um momento de discussão em grupos no Discord e depois um momento de integração no Zoom, tá? Então, fiquem só atentos, a mudança de ferramentas é aqui uma coisa rápida, e vocês vão ver que elas foram escolhidas de uma forma realmente a melhorar a colaboração, tá? Vai valer a pena essa migração de ferramentas também. E o painel Latam? Adriana, quer comentar esse painel? O painel Latam, então, veio aí numa, numa primeira investida, né, de a gente é, estreitar os laços é, com é, participantes da América Latina, com gente de outros países latino-americanos, né, nossos é, irmãos latinos aqui, né, pessoal. Então, temos a, a, o Andrés, que é do México, né, é, mas está nos Estados Unidos hoje. É, temos a Cláudia, que está no Chile, na Universidade Técnica é, Federico Santa Maria. Né? É, temos a Luísa, representando o Brasil, né? é, da IBM, São Paulo. E o Igor, também brasileiro, mas que está nos Estados Unidos. Então, isso vem... É, para buscar justamente a discussão, né, trazendo esses pontos de vista e para buscar uma maior interação é, e integração 
né, entre países e pesquisadores latino-americanos. Né? Isso vem também é, de uma iniciativa, aproveito para dar uma palhinha aqui, é, vender o peixe, né, é, que a SIGCAI está com uma iniciativa aí de é, montar um comitê especializado é, para a América Latina, né? Então, aguardem para breve aí e-mails e, notific... e, 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 enfim, e formulários e questionários <risos> sobre o assunto, né? Estamos é, é, finalizando essa coisa, né? Então, isso vem como também uma primeira investida nesse sentido, né? De maior integração e maior, é, é, entre países da América Latina. Maior discussão, tá? Tá, e a moderação vai estar com a Letícia... Ah, sim, e com claro. Luciano. Moderação com a Letícia e Luciano, não podia esquecer, né? <risos> e a programação social, hein? A gente teve um artigo na SBC Horizontes, a gente, a gente falava, e os eventos sociais nos congressos online? O que, que a gente aprontou para o WCO, meninas? O pessoal aí se puxou, ó. a Angélica, Noemi e o Jorge trouxeram para hoje um, uma dinâmica de interação sobre tipos de café, com sorteios ainda de kits, ó, então se liguem. Mini curso de vinho na nossa celebração, né, acho que vai ser, ela vai estar tá lá um, junto com a nossa celebração no final da, da programação de hoje. E amanhã vamos ter um momento de meditação, né, para a gente estabilizar aqui <risos> toda a alegria e euforia de hoje. E na, na quarta-feira, para a gente finalizar um grande estilo, um grande momento, o nosso evento WCO, um, um show de chorinho aí, onde a gente vai ter muitas surpresas nesse momento, né? A gente também não sabe de muita coisa, vamos, vamos aguardar esses momentos aí com o pessoal da programação. O que mais que temos aí? Essa é a nossa galeria para a gente conhecer vocês. Ó, de repente, uh, lá no site, né, a gente tem todos os links. Por e-mail, vocês também, uh, quem está se inscrevendo, tá, rece vai receber também os links com, essas, uh, com esses canais aí. E aí, vocês podem interagir lá, podem colocar né, imagens e o que acharem interessante. O que mais aí, Vaninha? Isso, é, é um pouco nessa linha, né? O, esse evento, ele quer muito aproximar as pessoas. E uma das coisas que a gente perde nos eventos é, online é essa interação social, essa coisa mais lúdica. A gente fica muito no técnico, na professora Vania, na professora Letícia, na professora Adriana, só que a gente tem outros lados, né? Que não é só o acadêmico. Então, esse é o momento da gente conhecer outros lados de vocês e a gente poder trocar a partir de outros interesses, não apenas os interesses acadêmicos, que é o que a gente vai ver nas sessões de discussão. Então, por favor, participem, temos aí o link, se de repente a gente puder colar lá também, entra, é público, todo mundo que estiver participando do evento é convidado a postar, a gente quer conhecer todo mundo mesmo. E aí eu convido a comunidade como um todo para a reunião da SESC, a Assembleia Geral da Comunidade geralmente acontece com a SBSC, mas como esse ano o SBSC foi adiado para abril de 2021, nós teremos a grande Assembleia é, na terça-feira às 17h30, no auditório do WCO, todo mundo convidado, toda a comunidade, então, por favor, venham. E já, já começamos, né, Adriana? Você é, moderando. É, vamos, lá, então, a próxima, nossa principal atração de hoje, né, é, para começar, vamos dizer assim, a nossa atração de início, né, para começar o evento, né, é, a gente trouxe o Mark Blatt, que é professor é, no, na Inglaterra, né, em UK, é Northumbria University, né, que vai falar para a gente sobre design fiction, que é uma técnica que é, vem gerando bastante curiosidade né, nas pessoas, né, então a gente quis trazer para, para todo mundo conhecer e quem sabe a gente não começar a escrever vários design fictions e submeter, ó, tem oportunidades aí né, é, para é, design fiction, né, então é, a ideia foi trazer o Mark para falar sobre isso com a gente, né. É isso? Isso. Daqui a pouquinho o Mark entra, isso, a gente já está é encerrando. Cinco minutos. <risos> Ou menos do que isso até. É, aqui, pessoal, tem o um link das redes sociais do WCO 2020. Por favor, entrem lá, compartilhem, né? Dê o um joinha, dê o um joinha também nessa apresentação aí. A gente também está inaugurando o canal da SESC, que o WCO também tem essa motivação de divulgar a comunidade de sistemas colaborativos. Então, apoiem a SESC, é, não tem aqui o Instagram da Sesc, mas a Bia pode colocar aí o link também, então entre na página, 
é, e curtam mesmo e, e participem, né? E eu acho que é isso. A gente já mostrou um pouco desse termômetro. Mudou alguma coisa, Letícia, do tempo interno da galera enquanto a gente estava aqui? Ah, deixa eu ver aqui. O pessoal, na verdade, tá, tá de boas. Tá, tá, tá de boas. boas. É... <risos> Tá de boas aí, ó, o pessoal tá, tá tudo, tudo bem, estão ótimos, começando a semana com o WCO, não tem tempo ruim, né? Como não, diz a Adriana. Esse é o slogan do WCO, oh. não tem tempo ruim. Então é isso, gente. A gente quer agradecer por todo mundo que tá aqui assistindo esse momento, não saiam, vai começar agora a palestra convidada, e, e é isso. Algumas palavras finais, meninas? Uh, não precisamos estar juntos para estarmos próximos e aqui estamos. É isso. É isso. Então, Adriana, é, posso... a gente vai sair para que você possa é, assumir, assumir a tela aí. Continuamos <risos> com o Keynote, agora vamos mudar o é idioma isso. também, então faça um shift aí do português para o inglês a partir de agora, pessoal. E vocês podem colocar comentários na palestra do Mar, que vai ser em inglês, mas vocês podem colocar comentários em português e a gente faz a tradução também, tá bom? Então participem, interajam. É, o Mar vai trazer também o Miro Board para vocês poderem interagir. Então fiquem ligados no link do Miro Board que vai rolar aí. Interajam, participem, tá bom? Me despeço, Adriana. Boa palestra para você, boa palestra para o Mar. <risos> boa palestra <risos> para todos nós. Tá bom. Então. Então, gostaria de dar as boas-vindas, agradecer a todos é, que estão por aqui, né, é, e dar as boas-vindas para o Mark, né, Mark Blythe é um etnógrafo, né, que trabalha no campo de interação humano-computador, né, é, e sua pesquisa é, fala da revolução digital, né, então ele foi editor de um livro chamado Phonology, né, é Critical Theory for Interaction Design, né, é, e coautor do Research Fiction and Thought Experiments and Design. Então, são parte de fundamentos de HC que ele vai falar aqui para a gente, tá? So, Mark, the floor is yours. Welcome. And I'm really sorry we couldn't bring you here to Rio and to Brazil. Um, I would have loved to have hosted you in person here, but, you know, maybe next year we'll, we'll be uh, able to do that. <laughs> that. That would have been so nice, but I'm sure sitting in my back back bedroom you know it's all <laughs> nice as being in Rio. oh strange times thank you so much uh for the um introduction and um uh, and for the invitation it's it's a great pleasure to be here um these are weird times aren't they and i but i did think that we should uh try and do something with the keynote which involved a bit of online collaboration as that's what the workshop is about so um i hope everybody received the email with the invitation to a miro board in it um i think that was sent out by uh, the organizers earlier today so if you haven't had it yet please have a look in your spam folder where it might have gone um if you have got it it would be great if you could sign in it's a very painless process you just stick in your email address and then you'll be able to get onto a a shared whiteboard and i was hoping that we could do a little bit of online collaboration together as as we go through because i'm sure you don't want to listen to me talking solidly for 45 minutes into my into my webcam any more than i want to talk solidly for 45 <laughs> minutes so I'm, i'm i'm hoping that you can um start signing in so if you can sort of do that now while well, i'm i'm going to talk now for about 10 minutes of introductory type stuff so while i'm doing that please you know have a look in your email try and get into the miro board and once you're there just sort of scribble high on it along the left hand side of the board you should find a bunch of tools and if uh, there's three dots along the bottom and if you click on those you'll find a pen you should be able to say yeah Ad adriana is there now and and she's saying hello i can see but Adriana is the only person there. Letitia's no. just joined her. That's yeah. fantastic. So we have two people. A third person has arrived. That's wonderful. Just scribble, give us a, scribble a hi. Um, and if you could just, you know, as many as like, if, if I can get as many of you scribbling there, that that would be nice for later. But yeah, I shall start um, 
we're talking a bit now uh, with with some slides. So let me share my screen. Okay, can you can you give me a thumbs up if you can see that? Okay, Adriana. Yeah, are we good? Not, not yet. Can you see that? Uh, one second. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, there it is. Yay. Okay, we're in business. All right. So, yeah, um, today I, I want to talk about the varieties of design fiction because there's so much of it now. Uh, it's it's absolutely everywhere. If you Google it, you get uh, one of the first things that, that, that comes up is an article from the New York Times. It's everywhere. It's gone really mainstream. Um, so it's not just one thing. And I want to talk about all the different kinds of, of things that people are doing with it and say a little bit. Uh, about different techniques and different times that that, that people might use it. So um, I'm going to talk about the kind of visionary, predictive type stuff, the kind of future gazing type stuff that maybe is the first thing you think about when you hear a term like design fiction. But then I'm going to talk about more kind of practical planning type work, some of the critical work that's done, and 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 more uh, towards the end of of the more kind of experimental, exploratory stuff with it. Um, so I'm going to start with, with I've called it vision here. You could call it prediction or, or, or foresight, but, but I think vision is, is better because it doesn't suggest any kind of prophecy. I don't think that's what's happening. But there are some, you know, weirdly prescient examples of people who have looked to the near future and really got it right. And I want to start off um, with an example about video conferencing, really, uh, for obvious reasons. Video conferencing is now dominating our lives in a way that nobody expected it to just a few months ago. And of course, the technology has been around for um, absolutely ages. Uh, and there's a book from 1996 called Infinite Jest uh, by David Foster Wallace. And it touches on videophony in, in quite an interesting way. So that, that picture there is, is a, an indication of what a very large and difficult read uh, uh, infinite jest can be. Um, it's it's absolutely packed with footnotes, and in one of those footnotes, uh, there's this very long uh, little mini essay about uh, the rise and fall of a video phone uh, industry. And infinite jest is set in a near future, and and one of the interesting things about the novel is that the one of the themes it deals with is addiction to technology. It imagines uh, an entertainment technology that kind of finds a, almost a direct path to the pleasure centers of the brain and becomes utterly addictive. So if you sit down in front of it, uh, you just watch it until you you die. You, you don't do anything. People find you days later. Uh, uh, it's so compelling. And... Um, one of the one of the kind of um, side side steps in the footnotes is is what happened with with video phones. Why did it fail despite its initial huge popularity? And it starts off with a very novelistic set of observations about the way that we used to use old fashioned telephones. So there's a little quote here I'd like to read. Good old traditional audio only phone conversations allowed you to presume that the person on the other end was paying complete attention to you while also permitting you not to have to pay anything even close to complete attention to them. So the idea is, you know, you've got the phone there and you're maybe doodling, like I hope some of you have started doodling on uh, the Miro board. Um, you know, people used to keep pads next to their phone. You're walking around, maybe you're cooking, you might be doing your nails um, or whatever. Uh, but you can, uh, you don't feel like you're being rude and, and you don't have to give this kind of concentrated uh, attention. And I think that's kind of, that's partly one of the things that, that people find exhausting about, you know, days and days of back-to-back -back, uh, video meetings. You, you have this very kind of focused attention that an audio only phone call doesn't doesn't give you. So where does the design fiction come in here? Well, he starts to imagine some of the other problems that you might have with video connections. Um, uh, a serious one being people's vanity. Okay, so there's this bit where it talks about 
And the videophonic stress was even worse if you were at all vain, i.e. if you worried at all about how you looked, as in to other people, which, all kidding aside, who doesn't, right? So he Im imagines this kind of uh, uh, filtering process where a composite image of your best self is made on the fly by the computer, but he thinks this is probably going to be very memory intensive, and so he imagines that another industry will come up where you just wear um, a, a mask and sit there with a mask of yourself presenting your, your kind of uh, best image. But he doesn't leave it there. He kind of goes further than that and talks about... Uh, and, and again, you know, if that seems far fetched, you just have to look at Instagram filters and things like that to see the way that, you know, for a while now we've been changing our appearances drastically and so on. But he goes further than that and then thinks about the kind of impact that that might have in the real world. And he imagines that people start to feel this kind of stress about the gap between this kind of version, filtered version of themselves that they've been presenting and and the real one. And so there's this uh, enormous psychological stress there, which results in mass agoraphobia. People don't want to go out. There's no problem with that, though, because it just means there's this huge increase in online retail and so on. Um, and again, this is really oddly prescient. This is a, a, a headline from a recent Guardian article about how uh, you know, Instagram filters and so on are, are driving people to seek in um, plastic surgery. So, you know, really oddly prescient uh, um, albeit somewhat satirical, take uh, from a novel in 1996 about current technology. And this is absolutely nothing new. These eerie, almost eerie uh, predictions, maybe the best example of it, uh, is a novel called The Wreck of the Titan by Morgan Robertson. And this was published um, in 1899 and described a gigantic ship almost uh, of the same dimensions uh, as the Titanic, um, and also described as unsinkable and indestructible. Uh, and uh, there's an interesting moment where uh, he says, she carried no useless cumbersome life rafts, but because the law required it, each of the 3,000 berths in the passengers' offices and cruise quarters contained a cork jacket while about 20 circular life boy boys were strewn along the rails. Um, and in the novel, the ship hits uh, an iceberg and sinks, and um, almost everybody died. Um, it's, it's absolutely eerily uh, prescient, and it's so prescient that it's fueled uh, a lot of uh, conspiracy theories that the sinking of uh, Titanic was deliberate um, and planned. Um, but uh, Martin Gardner, the science writer and mathematician, has pointed out that you don't really need to have any gift of prophecy to see this. So um, before uh, Titanic was built, there were plans for other huge ships that didn't get built. And there were various newspaper articles about them. Uh, Morgan Robertson knew shipbuilding very well. He also knew the law and insurance around it. So these kinds of... Uh, 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 guesses were guesses, but they were informed guesses. They were good guesses. Um, and if you can imagine uh, a ship like that, you can imagine a ship like that uh, uh, going wrong, right? Um, similarly with H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells was 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 absolutely bang on uh, about um, a, a number of things. He was he not only uh, pictured. Uh, aerial flight long before it was um, uh, commonplace, but he pictured aerial warfare. Um, in a book called The World Set Free, uh, he wrote about an atom bomb. And at the time, he was reading fairly obscure scientific journal articles about um, uh, uh, that field. But it, he realized that, you know, there was a potential for energy, but also for destruction there. And he pictured this um, atom bomb, which would explode for around three days. He was wrong about that. But he was right to within about five or 10 years about when it would uh, be produced. Um, maybe the best example, though, of, of how this works is uh, a short story that he wrote in 1903 called The Land Ironclads. Uh, and this is a story about trench warfare. Um, and it was well understood in 1903 how difficult trench foot warfare was to break. You know, two opposing sides dug in, anybody cries to cross the French, immediately shot down. So Wells imagines this thing that he describes as a clumsy black insect 
an insect the size of an ironclad cruiser crawling obliquely to the first line of trenches and firing shots out of potholes in its back. Um, so, you know, it's not an accident that uh, in the First World War this was actually developed. And uh, uh, this story was uh, used to, um, you know, uh, to push that effort. Churchill was very involved in pushing that effort to develop the tank. And when it was finally developed, he wrote to, to Wells and um, told him uh, uh, that he'd been uh, very influential there. So it's not some sort of eerie prediction, but it's actually a feedback loop. You know, the, the auth these authors uh, are, are reading the science and that's informing the fiction and vice versa and you know the kind of uh this feedback loop is well documented there's a nice documentary called how william shatner changed the world and you know people go on record saying star trek really influenced my invention the guy who invented the cell phone uh steve pullman who invented QuickTime, uh is 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 there talking about how an episode of the next generation where data walks into his quarters and says play beethoven's fifth symphony or whatever and that happens that made him start um, his work on, on QuickTime. Uh, more recently, Elon Musk uh, uh, has launched the um, his cyber truck. And you can see very clearly that the design language that he has used there is drawn uh, from films like uh, Blade Runner and the first version um, of Total Recall. Again, that's, that's not an accident. Um, and similarly with the uh, Iron Man uh, movies, uh, you know, in 2008, we have Robert Downey Jr. Um, uh, flying through the skies as a kind of robot soldier. And then in uh, 2019, we have Frank Sabata on Bastille Day in France uh, flying around with a rifle. Um, just last week, uh, there was a news article um, about uh, Richard Browning using his flying suit um, uh, as a form of uh, mountain rescue and arguing that, you know, you can get up hills to lost climbers in the Lake District uh, much more quickly. So the feedback loop there is very important, um, I think. And um, it shows how serious fiction can be. Uh, and unfortunately, the term science fiction um, as, as, as kind of caused a, a problem for a, for a lot of writers in the genre. I think in the 19, you know, 30s and 40s and 50s, there were some very dodgy B movies and, you know, it kind of uh, made it seem as if it was all about monsters and ravens and so on. Um, and so uh, people like Robert Heinlein um, wanted to use the term speculative fiction about his work to kind of distinguish it from that kind of Monsters and Reagan stuff. Um, the term hard science fiction was used about people like Arthur C. Clarke, whose work was, you know, very, very, I mean, Clarke was in, you know, has been, you know, described as, as one of the kind of inventors of, um, of satellite uh, communication. Um, and so, you know, Science fiction kind of uh, is, 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 is a kind of difficult term for a lot of writers. Kurt Vonnegut said, I've been put into a box labeled science fiction and I want to get out. And Bruce Sterling uh, used the term slipstream fiction for people like, you know, Martin Amos or Salman Rushdie who are writing kind of magical type things that were speculative but not rigorous. And then in, in 2005, he, um, he started to use the term uh, design fiction. And, and really uh, did a lot to popularize this term. And he defined it like this. He said, you know, it looks pretty much like science fiction and it wouldn't occur to a normal reader to separate it from that. Um, the core distinction is that design fiction makes more sense on the page than fiction uh, does. Okay, so I've been talking for quite a while now and um, I, I wanna make sure that, that um, you guys are with me so i i'd like to have a look in in the miro uh, box now um adriana could you share the miro and see if this is going to work at all how many people have we got on miro some hooray we've got some on miro adriana are you are you there Yes, we should have 36. I see 30, actually 39 on Miro. That's brilliant. That's wonderful. Okay, so guys, in, in Miro, what I would like you to do, if you would, is to draw an imaginary engine. 
And I, I just go, I just want to leave that uh, completely open for you to interpret. Um, just draw whatever you like, use whatever tools you can find. Just do a doodle. Just take, there's a nice phrase that's used in illustration, which is uh, to take a line for a walk, just to start a line and see where it goes. So please just draw your own, doodle your own imaginary engine. And I'm going to come back after I've talked um, for, for another few minutes about a different kind of variety of design fiction. And I want to see what you guys have done. Is that OK? Does, does anybody have any questions before I go on to the next bit, either about what I've said already? Oh, I'm loving what's going on in Miro there. That looks great. Wow. Somebody is is really experimenting with those tools. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's great. Oh, there's video. Oh, there's video. How wonderful. Huh. Yeah, so do you get the idea, though? I'm, I'm going to jump into Mira, and I'll just kind of show you what I mean, maybe. All right, so if I go over onto the left-hand side, and I find a pen, and then I'm going to choose purple, and I'm going to start drawing really big, um, can you guys see what I'm doing over here? Let me find um, you. Um, you have to, you can zoom in or you can zoom out. So if you zoom out, it depends what device you're using. So you saw, you know, if you're on a trackpad, you can just uh, zoom as you would on anything else and you'll get a, a, a far, farther view. And I'm kind of over on the right to a lot of you guys and I'm just taking a line for a walk over here. Actually, it's a bit faint, so I'm going to go a bit closer in. So there's a kind of a tube thing I'm doing. I'm not particularly thinking about this. I'm not planning anything. It's just a doodle, right? I think I'm going to do something that looks like a spring coming down here, whatever. Yeah. I'm kind of starting to look like... You see what I mean? I'm just... It's... I have no idea what it is, and that's fine. It's some sort of machine, though, some sort of imaginary engine. I think I might give it a wheel. Why not? And another one over there. And I think I might make it gigantic. So I'm just going to put a tiny person there looking up, going, yeah. Yeah, do you get the idea? Let me find you. Okay, whoops. Ah, I know what will help find you. Okay, can you guys see that? Oh, that's not much better. Here you are. You got it? Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave you guys doing that. Hopefully, keep doodling, and and if if any of them look remotely like engines or machines in any way, then hooray! Ah, oh, I was I was looking at that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Whoever's done the cogs there, that's marvelous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, keep going with that, and and maybe um, you can just kind of like listen to me rattle on, and I'm going to go back into go back into this, and I'm going to share some more slides, hopefully. Okay, thanks, Adriana. Can 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 you see sure. my slides again? One second. Mark, please put your slides back because you have to share it with us again. Please what, sorry? 
uh, you yeah. have to share your slides back. I, I thought I had done. Sorry. I. Uh... Yeah. Can you not see that? I'm. I'm. I've hit the share button. I think is it because Adriana is sharing hers still. Actually, you are sharing mirrorboard, so just change to the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, I've I've hit share. Is it not working? Yes, because what's oh let, let's see if if it ah this, right. okay there you go okay um all right okay so good here we are all right so uh, the next kind of um, variety I want to talk about is is the kind of planning variety uh, and this is um. Uh, really uh, deeply intertwined with the, the history of uh, computing. And this kind of uh, speculative fiction isn't confined just to, you know, um, uh, authors. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I've got a little uh, quote here from um, a paper that uh, Ada Lovelace wrote uh, about a proposed analytical engine uh, developing uh, the work of Charles Babbage. So um, Babbage had uh, already made the, the difference engine and uh, he was applying for money to uh, build another much more ambitious machine. The difference engine performed calculus in the way that um, the, the machines that made uh, textiles uh, loom like, uh, you know, card readers uh, performed calculations in that way. And he wanted to be able to do something uh, much more ambitious. And there's a really fascinating uh, exchange uh, between them. Uh, and I just want to share this quote from Ada Lovelace about what this proposed machine might do. Uh, the analytical engine might act upon other things besides number, were objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations, and which should be also susceptible of adaptations to the action of the operating notation and the mechanism of the engine. Supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitched sounds in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations. The engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So, you know, um, Babbage and uh, Lovelace, uh, back in the Victorian era, were already thinking about what are the possibilities of uh, computing technology. And there's a, there's a brilliant uh, graphic novel called The Thrilling Adventures of Babbage and Lovelace that imagines an alternate reality where they get their funding and, you know, use their technology to solve crime. It's very fun. Um, but more mundanely, uh, writing fictional vignettes or scenarios is standard practice in, in the field of human computer action and in, um, in CSCW as well. Uh, and here's an example from John Carroll from back in 1999. And, you know, it's quite simple. Uh, it's a short little story and it describes somebody working uh, with a system and trying to accomplish a goal and the struggles that he's having within the interface. So an accountant wants to open a folder on the system on the desktop in order to access a memo on budgets. However, the folder is covered up by a budget spreadsheet that the accountant wishes to refer to while reading the memo. The spreadsheet is so large that it nearly fills the display. So the accountant pauses for several seconds, resizes the spreadsheet, moves it partially out of the display. And that's not the most exciting story, but it's a story, it's fiction, and it's a very useful fiction for you know thinking about the design of a system. Um, but even back then, that kind of uh, very plain uh, scenario uh, was, was kind of criticized by uh, people like Alan Cooper, who wrote a book called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And in that, he argued that very often computer scientists were either designing systems for themselves or at best designing systems for the guy in the next cubicle to them. And so for that reason, you would, God, you know, it's years since I've seen this error message, but it still kind of sparks a little flicker of horror in me, even though it's just an image that I've um, put in my slide here. Um, but you used to see this all the time. Uh, the program has performed an illegal operation and will be shut down. And I think this is a really nice example 
of some language that probably makes absolutely complete sense to the computer scientist who, who wrote it, but just fills the ordinary user with horror and dread and like, what have I done? And are the police on their way, you know? Um, so uh, Cooper and others argued that if we were going to write these scenarios, we should populate them with personas who weren't like us, people who were much more diverse. And so now it's standard practice in uh, any design project to create personas as well as scenarios and to try and have some kind of, uh, you know, variety and so on in, in, in the kind of cast of characters, as it were. And some of these kinds of scenarios have, um, you know, provided visions really for whole fields to work around. So maybe the most famous uh, set of scenarios uh, is uh, the Sal scenario set by Mark Weiser, uh, and he had a, a wrote a, an article for Scientific American uh, called The Computer in the 21st Century. And it describes pretty much the technology we're all living with and um, working with now. Um, I think in this photo, I think that guy with the beard, I think that actually is Mark Weiser. Um, and, uh, you know, the cell scenarios, I think, are really interesting because they'd kind of long before they exist, describe technologies that, that we now live with. Um, so in the scenario, Sal wakes up and opens the curtains and looks out the window, and the window has a display saying, so you know, your kids are up. And then she goes downstairs and she starts to read the newspaper and she has a special pen. She takes it out and marks a, a passage in the newspaper and sends it on to her colleagues. Um, on the way to work, she's driving and there's a, a thing called a four view mirror. And it says, oh, there's a traffic jam up ahead. You might want to go a different direction. Um, and when she uh, arrives in, in the work, she has a, a video conference, much like this one, talking to someone on the other side of the world, much like I'm doing now. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, there, there are activity monitors, which increasingly we're getting from our employers as well, uh, about, you know, what, what we've been up to. Uh, in the day. So, you know, over the, the, the next 20 years, all of these technologies uh, ultimately came to pass. And it's very useful to have these kinds of um, fictions to, to work around because it provides a common language, common set of goals and so on, and can be a real driver of development. So um, it's almost unavoidable, I think, to engage in design fiction in the early stages of a project, in the early stages of development work. Uh, and even in the most ambitious uh, kinds of uh, engineering projects, um, uh, like the one that Jeff Bezos is involved in. There's there's a, there's a really strong element of uh, of storytelling of design fiction. So um, I'm going to share with you now uh, a talk that Jeff Bezos gave. Um, I think it was uh, last May, and he's talking about O'Neill space stations. And on on the slide here, these images are taken from uh, NASA's uh, visualizations of O'Neill space stations from the 1970s. Uh, and I think it's really interesting the way that that Jeff Bezos frames this uh, in this clip. So hopefully you'll be able to hear the clip when I play it. So. Um, at the event where he, he kind of uh, makes this presentation, he starts off with a with a very gloomy picture of the world and talks about the fact that we're reaching uh, the end of the Earth's uh, energy and resources, and um, talks about how energy use is doubling every twenty five years, and he kind of paints this 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 kind of uh, vision that that ends up with rationing really. Um, looking at that photo now, it just kind of makes you think, yeah, we'll be rationing because he will have all of the money in the world and be, you know, gradually maybe doling it out. But he talks about space as, uh, you know, uh, the way forward. And um, he does it like this. He starts off talking about the O'Neill Space Station. So I'm going to, hopefully this will play. Hang on. What O'Neill and his students came up with was the idea of manufactured worlds rotated to create artificial gravity with centrifugal force. These are very large structures, miles on end, and they hold a million people or more each. Here's the International Space Station for scale. This is a very different kind of space colony. Let's take a look at what they might look like inside high-speed transport, agricultural areas. We added a little drone there. Cities in the background. 
Some of them would be more recreational. They don't have to have the same gravity. You could have a recreational one that keeps zero G so that you can go flying with your own wings. Some would be national parks. These are really pleasant places to live. Some of these O'Neill colonies might choose to replicate Earth cities. They might pick historical cities and mimic them in some way. There'd be whole new kinds of architecture. These are very, these are ideal climates. These are shirt sleeve environments. This is Maui on its best day all year long. No rain, no storms, no earthquakes. What does the architecture even look like when it no longer has its primary purpose of shelter? We'll find out. But these are beautiful. People are going to want to live here. And they can be close to Earth so that you can return. Which is important because people are going to want to return to Earth. They're not going to want to leave Earth forever. They'll also be really easy to go between. The amount of energy required to go between these O'Neill colonies from one to another to visit friends, to visit family, to visit one that's a recreational area, very, very low energy needs to transport and quickly. It's a day trip. So, um, yeah, I can see in the comments there a few people saying um, inspirational. It really is, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful. And those little animations, they're design fictions by any 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 definition that that, that I I know of, um, and you know um, he's selling a very positive vision there. He obviously is a, you know a, you know probably um, seeking investment of of different kinds and also public buy in and 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 so on, um, and it's deeply uh, deeply positive uh, and um, very hopeful, isn't it? You know when you kind of like look long term and oh my god, what what's the solution? Well, you know maybe this. But <laughs> that's not the only way to tell that story. And um, that kind of brings us on to uh, the next kind of category, the next variety of uh, design fiction. And that's critical design fiction. And I'd like to show you another clip from a different kind of fiction. But I think it's interesting because it's, uh, it's uh, the exact same idea. So this is a clip from the movie uh, Elysium, which is also about the O'Neill colony. So I'll just show a little bit of this trailer. So you see that? That's that's the same idea. That's the exact same idea Bezos was just saying. Welcome. Oh, hello, madam. Hello, Mr. I need to get to Elysium. Whoever has this has to. So that's probably enough there. You get the idea, right? You know, it's, it's the exact same idea, but the question is who gets left behind and what's it like when you're left behind and who gets to go and how do you get to go? Um, and it's a much bleaker view, uh, but the questions um, are, are interesting. No? Um, and I think it's a nice example because it's the same concept, really, the exact same concept, the same design. The fictions around it, though, are very very different and you know in, in a little while i want to say about the different kinds of plot that often drive uh, the, the the fictions in these kinds of uh, situations so critical design work has has been around also for a really long time um and it really you know if you want to trace its origins uh, you, you can go back to uh the designers of in, in italy 
in the 1960s. Um, Italian design in, in the 50s had become synonymous with chic. You know, if you wanted the best clothes, the best furniture, the best cars, you know, uh, you were looking at Italian designers. Uh, but a lot of people got quite um, uh, disenchanted with the kind of consumerism that that work was driving. And um, some people began to explore this uh, this design space in terms of, uh, of of a more kind of critical production. Um, so the image that you're looking at there is um, from a, a design company called um, Arcazoom, and they produce this whole book full of images uh, like this. Uh, and it's a project called No Stop City. And it's a kind of architectural model of uh, a city conceived as a grid of connected pods. And these pods were um, at once homes, offices, shops, workplaces. Again, it sounds familiar, doesn't it, right? You know, your home now is your office, is your shop front, is your, uh, is your you know? Um, so uh, again, uh, 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 very, very prescient uh, work, but critical. You know, these are very gloomy, dark, pictures and they kind of connote dystopia it's not yay this is the future isn't it exciting let's run towards it it's more kind of like oh my god how do we avoid this um and uh this kind of uh work uh was really taken forward by um Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby at the Royal College of Art um, at the uh, at the turn of the century, and I I, I used to think I, that I, I used to attribute actually the the the, the coining of the term design fiction to Bruce Sterling. I thought it first appeared in 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 the two thousand and five book Shaping Things, but um, uh, a PhD student of mine, Elizabeth Bowie, actually found uh, a, an earlier occurrence in 2003 by Alex Milton, where he was discussing uh, some of the work being done at the RCA. And there was an exhibition and there was a catalog and movies went along with it of the work that students were doing on a master's course there. And they, 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 these catalogs talked about these objects in the show as if they already existed. Um, so the quote here, Noam Turan's work has begun to explore the realms of design fiction through the medium of props and pseudo documentaries. One Arid suggests that Noam tends to develop fictional histories for his objects, deceitfully creating individuals and inventions as if they already existed and he merely discovered them. So uh, the image there is from a series called Objects for Lonely Men. And um, the idea is that these objects are uh, to comfort someone who has recently broken up from a relationship. So what this is, is, is a pillow breather. And the idea is that it uh, uh, recreates a sensation of someone's breath on your neck when you're alone in a bed. Um, this is cold feet. If you're missing, you know, uh, 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 the, the the cold touch of someone else's foot because you're sleeping alone. And uh, my favourite one is this: the sheet thief. And this rolls the sheet off you uh, as if someone is uh, taking it from you. So um, these are kind of ironic, and 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 uh, they they kind of occupy a space that Tony Dern and Fiona Raby really defined as the kind of space where design can function like an essay. Design can function not just as you know uh, an idea for a new product line or uh, some new service, but it can function in the way that you know a critical essay might function. Right. So they produced objects like the compass table. This is a table filled with compasses, and if you put your device on them, they'd all go crazy and kind of make you aware of the the kind of fields that were. Uh, uh, carrying around with us and there's tons of work like this now there's really you know just about every design course in in the world i think has some some version of um, critical design on it and you see artists doing really interesting projects like this one the menstruation machine uh which is uh you know it gives a, a man uh the idea uh of uh what it's like to uh menstruate um I, I, I saw this one I, I, I just um, found out about very recently, uh, Lithiopy. And this is a, a really interesting project that imagines um, a future society that's kind of built on the back of um, the lithium rush that's happening in uh, the Czech Republic. And it's this kind of uh, surveillance society where drone cameras are everywhere. And if you want to get married, you do it in front of drone camera witnesses. If you want to uh, make a business deal, you roll around a gigantic Bitcoin that is visible to the uh, uh, to the 
to the satellites. And if you want to make a deal, it's captured with satellites mapping your transaction. Um, it's, it's it's very very interesting. There's a link to it on the on the Miro board uh, as well. So yeah, Miro board. Let's just have a. I'm just going to see if anybody's. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to change the view. I'm just going to see if anybody's put anything up there. Ooh, some nice looking stuff over here. <laughs> I like the guitar. That's nice. <laughs> um, if you've got some, what I what I was um, hoping that you would do uh, as 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 I carry on, could you find somebody else's image, somebody else's drawing, and uh, start to label it up, give it a name? Yeah, it'd be good to kind of like, even if it's really just a, a few squiggles like you know collaborate what does this mean what could it be give it some labels give it a name give it some functionality i would like to see i would like to see some imaginary engine names if that's at all possible uh at the end of it okay um right so let me get back into my presentation okay so finally uh uh the category of exploration so um where design, uh, where that, that critical work can, can sometimes be a little bit pointed and, and you know, and, and it's often uh, thought of as a little bit maybe um, preachy. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting work which um, is, is much more kind of exploratory and, and, and harder to, to pin down. Um, so an example uh, of that is uh, Patricia Piccinini's uh, Young Family. This was done in uh, 2003. And uh, she is an artist who is uh, very interested in technology. And this is a response to early stem cell research and the idea that we may might one day want to grow organs um, for organ transplants. So it's a kind of genetic engineering uh, uh, thought experiment, if you like. What would it be like to, uh, you know, grow animals with particular uh, bioengineering needs in, in, in mind? And it's kind of disturbing, but it isn't just a, a dismissal of the idea and it isn't this horrific and, and isn't it awful. Uh, she very much starts from a position of, you know, technological change is, is just a fact and it will, uh, you know, be used to transform our lives in one way or another. And so I think this kind of begins to explore a space. Um, similarly, uh, the, the work of um, Julian Bleeker uh, at the Near Future Laboratory um, is, is a really good example of doing that. And Bleeker um, uh, thinks about design fiction as a kind of materialized thought experiment. Um, and he's done tons of really interesting work. Um, so this is uh, something that he did with the Mobile Life uh, team in Sweden. Uh, and it's a, a future IKEA catalog. Imagining with that company uh, products like, you know, uh, beds that sense how much you've slept, whether it's right temperature for you uh, to achieve your, your, your best sleep and so on. Uh, and again, this is, you know, from about 2016 now and more and more we're seeing uh, this kind of uh, thing happening, right? Um, uh, the latest edition of the TBD catalog, uh, I think TBD stands for to be designed, uh, uh, talks about eVantage. So the, 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 the brochure, the TBD catalog comes with like articles and advertisements for products and services that don't exist yet. Um, and I like this one. This is eVantage and this is uh, uh, an email system which is guaranteed, not read by any algorithm which is going to send advertisements to you uh, based on the contents of your email. Um, and this is some um, academic work from uh, Joe Lindley uh, uh, and uh, Paul Coulton and Rachel Cooper. And uh, they've done this really nice bit of design fiction around the smart kettle. Um, and it's a, you know, I, I think this is quite a nice way of doing design fiction. You know, you kind of Photoshop an, an Amazon box or whatever, and you've got a new product there uh, uh, and create some, um, you know, fake advertising for it. But this is, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, the, the kind of critical um, design type approach might just leave it at this. Linda is near, invite her for a brew. And you've got like one of those kind of semi pointless kind of technologies, right? You know, a technology in search of a problem. Why do you need a smart cow? Um, but they don't just leave it there. They take that um, idea further and really begin to explore. Okay, so what is the business model for this kind of kettle? 
right? Um, and they kind of capture that very nicely uh, in this image here, um, which shows the amount of data that's been downloaded. So maybe you're coming home from work and you say, put the kettle on through your phone so that it's boiled when you arrive, the data downloaded. But there's a much, much bigger column of data uploaded. And it's not clear what is being uploaded there. That's very ambiguous, you know. And they've linked this kind of work uh, in very interesting ways to, um, you know, questions around uh, 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 object-oriented ontological approaches, you know. And you can think of something like uh, uh, this sort of device in terms of, well, what does it mean to the consumer? M maybe it means being able to turn my kettle on at a distance, but what does it mean to the kettle? different thing, right? It means how much uh, information can I uh, uh, collect and send back to my um, manufacturer? Um, so um, I think there are all of these different related varieties of design fiction. And I just want to um, end, I just want to finish now by talking about what are the design, what are the design fictions around the current moment? What are the design uh, fictions and what are the plots that they're using? Um, and uh, there's a very interesting book called uh, The Seven Basic Plots by Christopher Booker. And he takes that very old idea, there are only seven stories in the world, and really nails what those seven stories are. And one of the most common ones is this, overcoming the monster. You know, uh, each of these stories, although on the surface very different, are all about a particular monster been overcome, even something like the Seven Samurai, or later the Magnificent Seven, you know, the bandits of the monster and, and they're overcome, Bond overcoming Dr. No. Even you could say, I think, uh, the accountant and the monstrous Excel sheet, it's the same plot. It's not as dramatic, maybe, as the Hollywood version, but it's the monster, right? The bad design monster, and it has to be overcome. And if you look more closely at that, um, that early uh, scenario, there's a moment uh, which always happens in Overcoming the Monster where the hero prepares. So we learn that that the architect that Carol was talking about struggling with that um, spreadsheet, he has an interest in bridge failures. And as a child, he saw a small bridge collapse. And it's just a bit of that, like, you know, that, me, that, that bit where Chief Brody is looking through all of the images of shark attacks before he goes on the uh, the, the, the quest to go and um, kill it. Um, so I think it's interesting to ask, what's the story when you're looking at a, a design fiction? And at the moment, there's a lot of design fiction around um, COVID-19, of course. What, you know, why wouldn't there be? Um, and a lot of it is kind of uh, state-sponsored design fiction. So um, in April of 2020, Matt Hancock, who is the UK... Um, uh, Minister for Health, made a statement about a track and trace app uh, that was being planned. And, you know, uh, uh, he kind of tells this story that ends all data will be handled according to the highest ethical and security standards and would only be used for NHS care and research. And we won't hold it any longer than is needed. Um, but what he left out of that story uh, was uh, the, the 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 question of whether it would be a centralised or a decentralised track and trace system. And what the government were hoping to do at that time was to have a centralised database which would hold uh, uh, as much more information than uh, Google and Apple were prepared to give anybody else. And uh, they wanted to use Bluetooth in a way that Apple and Google are both kind of built in safeguards against anybody using it in that way. Um, and uh, the company that they were going to use to do that was an AI firm that uh, Dominic Cummings here used uh, to push the Brexit uh, vote. And um, Cummings himself, uh, he's, he's a very uh, senior, he's a chief advisor to the prime minister. Um, and he put this extraordinary blog post out um, uh, asking for uh, uh, data scientists. It was a, a recruitment drive, but a very weird recruitment drive. And it was couched in the language of fiction. So he said, we need some true wildcards, artists, people who never went to university and fought their way out of an appalling hellhole, weirdos from William Gibson's novels, like that girl hired by Big End as a brand diviner who feels sick at the sight of Tommy Hilfiger. So um, this is the, this is a bit of fan fiction around that character, and you know she's the person uh, who can kind of uh, 
spot trends and know intuitively what's happening. And so, you know, these kind of fictions are, are everywhere. We we use them to shape our understanding of the world. And I think sometimes they can be very dangerous, um, especially if they're the, just the simple overcoming the monster type, which this is what Nick Hancock was kind of like, oh, it'll be fine, don't worry. You know, and immediately academics went uh, and, and uh, scrutinized that. Um, it was a very interesting paper um, by um, some French academics uh, uh, that talked about anonymous tracing as a dangerous oxymoron. And uh, uh, it had a bunch of, uh, you know, scenarios, short fictions expressed as cartoon strips where bad actors uh, would be able to uh, identify people. Um, uh, and either, you know, uh, shut them out of a job interview um, uh, because they uh, were identified as positive as, uh, later on, um, or, you know, for one neighbour to identify another neighbour um, as the person who had uh, uh, um, infected them. Um, so I, I think that, you know, these varieties of design fiction are all um, very uh, relevant right now. And we're seeing this more and more in the culture. Um, and for me, uh, you know, some of the most interesting um, is the kind of uh, folk design fiction that's been happening, uh, where people will kind of make these uh, machines to kind of uh, uh, enforce the two meter distance. Um, there was a really interesting one by a geographer done in Toronto, and he built this scaffolding that he put. And, you know, for me, this is a materialized thought experiment. This is brilliant design fiction and uh, wore it so that he could demonstrate that it was actually impossible given all the street furniture, given the parking, given the proximity of other people to keep a two meter distance when that was uh, the norm. So um, what I want to kind of end with here is, is, is the notion that none of these um, borders are, you know, uh, impermeable. There's a lot of movement between them. And, um, uh, you know, they all overlap, uh, essentially. And I think, you know, it's important not to get too kind of uh, worried about definitions. In it. Is it speculative or industrial or is it critical or, uh, or whatever? Um, uh, I, I think um, more and more uh, 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 the the uh, the different kind of shades need to come together so that we're avoiding that kind of simplistic overcoming the monster model, especially at times like this. And I think I'll end it there. And thanks so much for your patience. And I'm just going to go and have a little look at what you've been up to in Miro, if anything. So um, I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much, those of you uh, who are still there. It's so weird. I don't know if you're there. Hello. <laughs> I hope you are. Yes, I'm still here, and we're all still here, and we do have a few questions. Oh, we have oh we've, got a, we've got some stuff, a hug machine, a hug t-shirt, yeah. oh, that's, that that's awesome. <laughs> nice, nice, cool. Uh, yeah, so questions, please, yeah. Yes, um, I did, I'm trying to have them posted, but still, um, yeah, do you see it? Comments uh, on the impact yeah, of the known... Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think there, 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 there is a problem with the kind of, um, with the science fiction inspiration sources that typically get drawn on. Um, so, uh, very often, you know, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it can become almost cliched. So there isn't, it's almost impossible to discuss surveillance without discussing 1984. Uh, and, you know, there are different sorts of uh, uh, fictions that you can draw on. And certainly, you know, there is a kind of um, a, a dominance of, of a particular kind of uh, set of concerns. But equally, you know, there are people like, you know, um, uh, Ursula Le Guin, um, who write specifically um, uh, around gender in very interesting ways, which, you know, um, you would hope to see more of. Um, a while ago, uh, somebody uh, uh, pointed out that, you know, we very rarely think about uh, the kind of science fiction that is being produced, say, in China uh, uh, at the moment as well. I think there, you know, there are very specific cultural and regional um, biases as well uh, that are a problem. And um, uh, I recently read um, 
uh, Chixin Lee's uh, uh, The Three Body Problem. And it's mind blowing and absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, it's awesome. I I read it too. Oh my god! It it just completely blew me away and sent me off thinking in ways that I hadn't expected to be thinking. And it was it was just you know I I would you know really recommend as as wide a set of of, of readings as possible and as as diverse a, a set of inspirations as, as you can um, as you can as you can manage really. Yeah, if I if I may comment a little bit yeah. as someone who has um, really loves science fiction, to be honest, yeah. and I've read a, a bunch of the classics and stuff, and I find yeah. that reading the more uh, the newer stuff, which I'm just um, learning about. So you know, you got Six and Lu, you got uh, there's some other Chinese authors and Korean, and there's uh, and uh, Jemisin, and there's Neri Okorafor and, and all different. Um, and I find it so refreshing. Then maybe we're we're just looking too far back. We need to look at at more recent fiction to go beyond uh, whatever stereotypes we've we've had for a long time. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, I think science fiction is is a literature of ideas. So I think if you're interested in gender, then a really good place to start would be The Left Hand of Darkness, which is imagining oh, yeah. a world without gender, right? Uh, or at least a, with a very different kind of conception of uh, gender. Um, and um, uh, Chicks in Lee for me, uh, you know, uh, was really useful just because it was so unfamiliar. The history that he was drawing on was so unfamiliar. So that book begins with an account of the Cultural Revolution uh, in China in the 1960s. I knew very little about it and um, I had to start reading the history around it and it made me think about uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, it made me start thinking about social media very differently, for one thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the more unexpected um, the kind of uh, journey you're taking on, the better. Somebody just asked a question about ethics, and I saw it for a second on my screen. Yeah, yeah. It's we'll bring it back. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I, think, I, I think that's a really important question, and I think design fiction um, is very useful for thinking about ethics, um, particularly when you're thinking about design fiction as thought experiment. So very often, you know, you can frame a design fact, a fiction as, you know, a, a thought experiment in the way that you might in philosophy or, uh, or, or in ethics. And, and one, uh, you know, recent example of people doing that um, is adapting the trolley problem which is a thought experiment in ethics. You know, it's very famous where, um, you know, uh, there's a train operator and if he throws a switch, he can send a, a train down one track and it will only kindle, kill one person. And if he doesn't throw the switch, then it will kill five people. And so the uh, the ethical problem is, is, is what do you do? And, um, you know, people who are uh, driving, uh, who are developing um, uh, autonomous cars, you know, have have been looking at that question and trying to apply that in in very practical ways. So I think um, design fiction and um, and an ethical thought experiments go together really, really uh, well. And you know, there are other kinds of um, you know, it's it's like the experience machine. The experience machine is another kind of um, ethical thought experiment. And um, in that one, a machine is imagined where it can give you the memory of having done something such that the memory is indistinguishable from a real memory. So you can they say if you want to write, you know, a great novel, you can go in the experience machine and have and come out and have had the experience of having written that without actually having to do it. Right. And it's like, is it the same? Would that be the same thing? Is 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 the philosophical question? And in 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 the philosoph in the philosophy literature, it's kind of used as an argument against. Um, uh, you know, uh, very um, utilitarian accounts of happiness and, and 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 happiness for the greater number of people. You know, if that's all we're doing, why not plug them all into experience machines, right? And you know, of course, it was the base, basis for the Matrix as well, and and those kinds of things. So, yeah, I, I think. Um, I think I I don't know if that gets to the question. I'm just looking back at the what are the constraints to project to protect the individual. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really interesting question. I think, you know, I guess it kind of 
do, the 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 choice of form is really important for this you know so i i think a lot of the time um you know uh designers say uh will um be very drawn to um a a, a, a prop or a model or a sketch um uh, or or a short film um and you know they can very often kind of uh focus in on objects or interfaces and i think sometimes a, a text-based uh fiction um which is a first person narrative can you know really uh help to get inside the 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 head of a user uh or or, or the individual in in that respect i mean i think you really can think of you know um books like um uh you know uh uh, the Handmaid's Tale, say, as an extended thought experiment uh, around the kind of social change, but these social changes are also um, technological. I think there was, I think there was another question. Was that that just flashed up? Yeah, one last question. We have time for um, more positive. <laughs> we always think of it in such a negative way. <laughs> Uh, design fiction can help us build a future with technology and more de democracy and social equality. Um, yeah, that's a great question. You know, because <laughs> I, I think I think so much of of, of design fiction and um, and and future gazing is really dystopian. We're really living through a dystopian moment. There was a super interesting uh, interview with uh, a science fiction novelist called Neil Stevenson. And he was speaking at a tech fair and there's a video on YouTube of it. And the um, the person who's moderating the session has to tell everyone off and say, look, we've got a really famous author here and nobody is looking up from their phones. And could you just look up from your phone from a, for a second? And Neil Stevenson um, starts to talk about dystopia in this, in this talk. And he said, you know, it used to be that dystopia was a fairly technical term that you would only really hear in an English literature seminar. And now it's a genre on Netflix. Why is that? Why is there so much dystopian thinking now? And what is it about dystopian thinking that we enjoy? And I think there's a real danger to dystopia. One, because it's easy. I think it's really easy to kind of go, oh, well, let's see how this is going to become even even worse. But I think also there's a kind of pleasure in it. So um, Savoy Zizek talks about the kind of uh, nostalgia for the present that you have if you're watching The Handmaid's Tale. So you can be watching, you know, the new series of that and thinking well things aren't that bad at least and and it's and it's curious even though it's bleak and awful it's curiously comforting so i think the 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 real challenge is is this one how do you do uh how do you do utopia um yeah it's it, and, and I, I think especially you know appointments like this which is so challenging and so difficult it's hard but good luck with it my gosh <laughs> <laughs> So I think we're out of time. Thank you very much again, Mark. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody. And, and we will make sure to invite you as soon as travel is resumed. I might so know what? I didn't even realize that you were in Rio. I'm going to feel really depressed for the rest of the evening now. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Back to my third um, have a great conference. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you so much for taking accepting our invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.